affecting these symptoms. And, and I'm just going to share a few of the symptoms because I am seeing so many people with the vaccine injuries. And those are heart rate, you know, increased heart rate right after a vaccine, migraines, chest pain, shortness of breath, fatigue, brain fog, change in bowel movement, new onset of Parkinson's, ALS, cancer in the young. I have a 40, I've been in practice 30 years practically in GI. I have a 48 year old who's never drank alcohol, never used any drugs, clean, healthy, skinny, has pancreatic cancer stage four after four vaccines. Now, probably it's not relate, related, but we have to pay attention because in 30 years, I have never seen a 48-year-old with, with terminal cancer so fast. So these are the things that, and, and so for me, when I see my work on the microbiome, I say, well, it does make sense, right? It does make sense that if you have invasive cancer is linked with zero bifidobacteria, and bifidobacteria seems to be this big trillion dollar issue of probiotics, maybe we need to focus because the microbiome is going to tell us what's going to happen in the future. You know, and, and I hate to bring back autism again, because every time I bring back autism, people think I'm an anti-vaxxer. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I put vaccines to market. I've done a dozen clinical trials for pharma, bringing vaccines to market. These are not your typical vaccines. This is a new technology that we have never seen before. And if we don't pay attention to the side effects on both sides of the politics and conservatives and liberals, we are going to lose humanity. And I hate to be dramatic, but unfortunately, I, we are in 1980. Autism was one in 2000. It's now one in 30. Cancer, we just saw the data increased in the young. Aggressive cancer increased in the young. This is becoming the new normal. Increased cancer, increased neurological problems, increased Parkinson's. You know, this needs to be paid attention to because in 10 years from now, you're going to have a lot more complications. To me, the microbiome is wide open right now. So all viruses are penetrating because there's an imbalance in the microbiome. We need to close that, that colonic leakage to stop these viruses from penetrating because our immunity is our gut. And if we don't pay attention to that, we've lost. So I tried to speak up. By the way, I spoke up on one of the papers. I published a paper, hypothesis, ivermectin increases bifidobacteria. That was a hypothesis, right? I can write whatever I want on a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis. I posted it on Twitter. I got shut down for like, six hours. Okay. It took like some, you know, friend of mine who supported Twitter to get me back on Twitter. So, and, and then on top of that, now my paper was, um, tri triggered a critique by some no names on a website called pub Peer, who basically, uh, decided that I quoted some papers that were retracted. And because I quoted some papers that are retracted, that paper should be an expression of concern. So on my paper, if you look at the hypothesis of ivermectin, you will see expression of concern. And the expression of concern is because I quoted retracted papers that said ivermectin worked. Now, those papers were probably retracted by the same people that are censoring, you know, us from speaking. So my question is, it's a hypothesis. If I want to put Santa Claus is exist, it's my hypothesis. I can quote whatever I want in a hypothesis. It should not be an expression of concern. So this tells you the amount of corruption and the amount of censorship that is even occurring at the academic level with the journals. And by the way, that same website is attacking every single one of my papers, including one paper where we were the first lab in the world to identify whole genome sequencing of COVID in the stools, which, by the way, led the National Institute of Standard and the government to look at the septic tanks. So that paper is a, is a landmark study that took six months of peer reviewed by doctors and scientists to criticize before it got up into the publications. The fact that there was there's someone criticizing that paper after it went through peer review and that person is anonymous is telling of what's going on in the medical field. So now I'm asking you, why would any scientist or physician want to do anything in this environment? Why would I want to come out with any more information 
in science on the microbiome, when this kind of pressure is going on, do we not think that interfering with research and science is interfering with everybody? It's interfering with research interferes with everyone. I'm sorry to have spoken so much, but essentially I'm very passionate about this. And this is a topic that's really dear to my heart. And if anything, if I'm exposing the corruption instead of exposing the microbiome, well, be it. But we need to expose both. And Sabine, thanks for thanks for the comment. Thank you for that. Because in, this is what the, today's drop is about academia also being in cahoots to make sure that they censor. So, and you're quite right. To, in order to basically get published in academia, you have to follow the normal narrative. And hence why I was speaking against doctors who didn't do that and basically proliferated and got other people banned on social media or various other avenues to proliferate certain ideas and ideologies. And so I commend you that because I do have friends who were in similar situations to you who basically did, were, did risk their jobs and were on the front line because they're willing to speak out about this. So yeah, I commend you a lot. And you, you're only a yeah, single voice and, is allowed. Yeah. And by the way, uh, my friends in academia are rooting me. You know, I'm friends with a lot of doctors at Harvard, MD Anderson, Yale, you know, Mayo Clinic, you know, we're all part of this group, right? Because we see each other at meetings, we talk about it. And they basically, I'm in a different position because I'm independent. I've been doing research as a, you know, in clinical trials for 30 years as an independent. I'm not part of a hospital. A hospital doesn't tell me what to do. I don't need to be, you know, following the guidelines of a hospital. We have our own standard operating procedures to function independently of the hospital. But my friend, my friends are rooting me on because they they need me to be a voice. And and behind me is thousands and thousands of physicians. You know, that paper on the hypothesis of ivermectin got 56,000 views and reads. That's enormous. So there's a lot of doctors paying attention and a lot of scientists paying attention. And if I'm their voice, and I've, and by the way, all this research is paid by me. Nobody is paying. I didn't get an NIH grant. I didn't get a hospital grant. I didn't get a pharma grant. I paid for it with my own savings, my husband and I. So this is, there's no benefit for me to, to, to say one data or another. In fact, it's even worse for me to come out with the data that's opposing the narrative because I'm in the public's eye now and, you know, I'm a target. So you know, but it needs to be told. It needs to be said. Nobody wants to be the person that is shaking the beehive of pharma. But the beehive of pharma needs to be, you know, shaken in a way because we are killing the microbiome. We need to come back and say we're overdoing. We're overdoing with antibiotics. We're overdoing with vaccinations, perhaps. We're, we're definitely doing a new technology on the whole world that is technically should not be should have been done in, in, in quarters, you know, maybe do one country and see how that's doing, you know, isolate one country and see how they're doing. But in, instead, okay. it's everybody. So that's it. I'd like to go to Jim and then I'd like to go back to Name Redacted to continue reading the files. Jim? Okay. Yeah, hey, I, by the way, Sabine, that's just oh, amazing no. stuff you're talking about. And I think you're right on target. But, you know, I want to it, it kind of touches on this issue of propaganda. Someone was mentioning it earlier. I think maybe. Well, I can't remember who it was. But anyway. Listen, uh, they, they, they were saying, so how do you deal? Oh, I know, Liza, maybe you were asking, how do you deal with propaganda? Well, the thing is, you don't. I mean, there is a way to there's an indirect way to deal with it. It's called the education of critical thinking. You know, most propaganda is illogical. It uses, uh, uh, it breaks the basic rules of logic, the law of non-contradiction, the law of causality. Uh, it uses weird language. You know, uh, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas is the one that, that developed the, the concepts of uh, the analogical use of language and the implications of how we use language. The, the way you deal with propaganda is uh, critical thinking. Now, I was listening to Brett Weinstein, who was recently on uh, the, I'm sorry, Eric Weinstein, the, who was recently on Joe Rogan program, and he totally changed my idea of peer review. I had a, a far different way of thinking about it than I did after hearing what he said. He kind of shared the fact that back in the day, I think it was the 1960s, and I actually shared this up in the nest, a graph that he shared. 
Um, in the 1960s or beginning about that time, uh, there there was I, he named the guy and I forgot his name and I apologize for that, but um, who wanted to make a lot of money uh, with academic journals and began the peer review process because as he was working this out, uh, he had to make certain that uh, the journals got sold, but he didn't have enough editors to uh, deal with it. So that thus now you have peer review. Now I, I, I haven't validated that yet, but I do trust uh, Eric Weinstein. But th this is the issue. We are in a place, and what is so important about this, and, and, and by the way, I have deep respect, Dinesh and Liza and all the people that I might disagree with on things who did all this work with uh, having to deal with patients and trying to figure out in the early days of COVID when we had no freaking clue what was going on. I have deep respect for having gone through that, but the reality is that <laughs> there is all of that is irrelevant when it comes to speech. Like there are consequences when people say stupid things or wrong things. But the way we deal with that consequence in a free society, which is the real one of the great innovations of Western democracies, is the ability to speak out and make assertions until they can be negated for, for whatever reason at the risk of being negated even. And what we are seeing happening increasingly, and in the United States, the trigger may have been Donald Trump. And you know, he says some wild things, and it's problematic. But the thing is, and, and he's been effective at it too, in certain ways politically. And so people are worried about that. But the thing is, you don't deal with that by shutting down speech. You deal with that by teaching critical thinking. In the United States and in many parts of the West, and, and actually it's, seeping into Asia and other places as well, there's this demand, for example, to uh, deal with, this is why critical race theory and the transgender issue are so important. Not because we need to be upset with people who believe in critical race theory, or we need to not care about race and be white supremacists, or we need to hate trans people. Those aren't the problems here. And those aren't the results when we push back on things. Those are all issues that are designed to, um, to impose a way of thinking upon people because someone else has a certain way of thinking about it. That is as bad and maybe in some cases worse than any COVID misinformation that happened. But here's the thing, to deal with that in a free society, you, it, it, as we've seen here in the United States, you need parents to go up to school boards and say, no, we don't want critical race theory taught. What's the pushback on that? Well, not only do you have teachers unions telling parents they're stupid, but you, you've now got a Department of Justice that is out investigating parents who would push against that. This is the, it, it, so this, this, this problem that we see revealed in this particular uh, Twitter files is part, it's on steroids, part of a bigger issue that we have. The reality is that the great, as I've said before on these spaces, the greatest amount of misinformation that we get in volume, not always in consequence, is what we call elections. And elections are filled with mis and disinformation. However, we want to qualify those terms, even qualify their usage, which I think is, is somewhat suspect. But we, we have to allow this kind of speech, and we have to combat it through real education. In the United States, we have the government's, government is running education almost entirely. It is almost exclusively a monopoly. You have some outlets for people, and those outlets are increasing a little bit after COVID, but again, not substantially. We have government teaching children. We have government employing uh, methodology, as we just learned about today, and we keep learning about in the Twitter files, to adjust, to massage, and to direct the conversation in an entire culture. And the American 